Experience Life. How's everybody? Good to see a packed house today. Awesome to see. Want to welcome those of you at Church Online or at one of our West Texas campuses. This is week five of a series that we've been in called Joy Jitsu. And basically in this series, as you know, if you've been here, we've been walking verse by verse through the book of Philippians, talking about how to have true joy. A lot of people talking about joy these days and happiness and how to get it and a lot of people looking for it in places that don't end up delivering. And so then they go, hey, well, what does God have to say about this? And so that's what we've been talking about in his word. But before we get started, I wanted you to see a brief uh, video clip. It's a 2020 interview with Tom Brady, a quarterback of the Patriots, and he's talking some about this. And I just think it's really interesting and kind of gives us a good gauge of what people are really thinking about this subject. So uh, take a look at this video and then we'll get right into it. He said, gosh, there's got to be more to life than this. And a lot of people would say, how could there be more to life than that? I mean, you're worth tens of millions of dollars, extremely famous. Most people know his name, and he's still saying, hey, the, I got all of this, and I think I'm still missing something. Like, there's got to be more to life than what I've experienced so far. So it shows us it's not in fame, true joy, money, true joy. Nope. What is it? The Bible's been telling us the last couple of weekends. If you've missed any of the messages, you can always get them online on our website at experiencelifenow.com. But we're going to keep talking about this today because it's especially relevant. People thinking about it. People talking about it. If you've got a Bible, Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Philippians 3. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you one. This is just a New Testament and an easy-to-understand translation that you can pick up on your way out. Otherwise, verses will be on the screen. But I hope you have one of these and that you're reading it regularly because if you do, I'm telling you, it will change your life. You read it and apply it to your life. Philippians 3. Now, here's kind of the problem, all right? I mean, I'm not sure whose bright idea it was to do uh, the book of Philippians in six weeks. I really don't know. I think it was me. But uh, we've done like the first, you know, we got through four of the weeks and we've only made it through two chapters. And so we got two weeks left, which means all of chapter three today and all of chapter four next weekend. So we have to move. It's going to be awesome. And uh, maybe next time we'll do 33 weeks or something like that. But six is kind of crazy because this stuff is rich for sure. So hopefully you're reading it on your own. Uh, God's speaking to you through his word. So Philippians three, verse one, let's get right into it. We'll do a lot of this today. Paul says this, whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. He talks about that a lot, right, in this letter. That's why it's the theme, joy, rejoice in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you these things, and I do it to safeguard your faith. Then he says, verse 2, watch out for those what? Those dogs, those people who do evil, those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. Now, Obviously, he's calling them dogs. He's not very happy with them. Now, that's not usually the word we would use today to talk, you know, talk about somebody we're not very happy with. Probably a different word because today, dog like means I love you. It's like, what's up, dog? Oh, nothing, dog. Just chilling, dog. You want to hang out today? Sure, dog. What time? Three o'clock, dog. Okay, I'll see you there, dog. And you say, you say dog because it's like, dude, I like you. Like, you're cool. Like, even my daughter, my four-year-old McKinley, I often call her Mac Dog. Like she's, but she's a girl. I know, but it means I love her. I mean, it's Mac Dog. Mac Dog. Sometimes I call my wife M Diggity Dog. So, I mean, it just depends. I mean, it just, that's just this is the word you use these days, all right? And while my four year old likes the nickname Mac Dog, she thinks it's kind of cool, uh, like D A W G, obviously. And so uh, she likes that. But what she likes, what she would rather me call her is what she usually tells me. She'd rather me call her Little T. <laughs> You're like, what is that? that? That's what we call her sister. She wants to be called what her sister's called. That's often what we call her sister, Karis, who's my one-year-old, who's crazy sometimes, especially around dinner. What she'll do, and parents, you, you've probably been there before, and if you haven't, then you, you're fixing to need to pray for me. But at dinner, like this one-year-old, she's sitting in her high chair, and she's got her tray right with her food. And often what my one-year-old will do, which causes us to call her little T, is she'll take food off of her tray, grab it, and chunk it on the floor right in front of us. And we're like, no, no, that ain't happening. So we'll swat her hand or something, carrots, little tea, like little toot is what we mean. You know, little tea, you better not be throwing food on the floor. And a lot of times, church, you know this. You've seen this. Please tell me you have. So we'll, we'll, she'll get in trouble. One-year-old, she almost two. She'll get in trouble, and she'll pick up some more food, smile at us, and chunk it down again. 
I'm, and then usually I'm like, little T, big T, fixing to get all up on you. I mean, I mean, is it, if you can to regulate up in here, big T, I mean, big T is not happy. And in case you're wondering who big T is, it's my wife. And so, uh, <laughs> big T, she's out of town. She'd kill me if I said that. So anyways, uh, uh, <laughs> so we call her that just because she's toot. And we're like, I can't even believe she would do that right in front of us. And so because we call her little T, my oldest, she thinks she should be called little T, but I'm like, McKinley, that's not a good thing. I mean, it's not, Mac Dog's a lot better. And so anyway, but he's calling them dogs, but he doesn't mean it in a, in a good way. I mean, he's upset with these folks because these are religious Jews that he's talking about here. And basically he says, verse two, they were adding to the gospel by saying, you've got to be, C word, church, circumcised to be saved. Like, that's a, that was a big deal. I Maybe mean, you know that to the Jewish community. When a baby boy, eight days old, he would be circumcised with a sign of the covenant. So they were thinking to themselves, hey, if we all had to get circumcised, these Gentiles, you know, they wouldn't be saved. They need to be snipped too. I mean, they need, they need to go through the snippage because we've all been through that. And that, and that, was, that was painful. And so we, we can not mean anymore eight days. But, uh, you know, they, they need to go through that. So they were basically saying their gospel was... Jesus plus circumcision. So Paul would preach throughout Scripture. You see it from Jesus. The gospel, the, the true gospel, is Jesus plus nothing. Like, we don't add anything else to what he's done. We just trust in him, and then we're saved. It's Jesus plus nothing, not Jesus plus this list of things that we could do for him, or Jesus plus circumcision. So Paul's calling him out and saying, you add into the gospel by saying Jesus plus something. You're a dog, man. That's, that's what he's calling them. Check this out. Basically, how a lot of people like to describe this Jesus plus something else is religion. Just the term religion. When you think about religion, what you usually think about is man's attempt to get to God on his own. Look at the world religions. They're saying, if you do this, you'll be right with our God or whatever. If you do this, but it's all about you. So here's some definitions for you. Religion equals, I perform, like I'm good, I do what I'm supposed to do, and God accepts me. That's what religions would teach. I perform, I do something good, God accepts me. Which is horrible news, by the way. That's horrible news, because you never know if you've done all that he requires, so you never really even know if you're right with him. I mean, it's bad news. The gospel, though, Christianity, would teach something different than all the other religions. Gospel is not, I perform, God accepts me. Gospel is, Christ performs, God accepts me. You catch that? That's incredible news. Christ performs like he lives the perfect life. He dies to pay the payment, or the penalty of my sin. He performs and he does for me what I can't do for myself. What separates Christianity from all the other world religions is everybody else is saying, this is what man has to do to get to God. And Christianity says, this is what God did in coming to save man. And it's about Jesus, not about what I can do for him. It's about my faith in Jesus. Paul's saying the gospel is Jesus plus nothing. So when people start adding to the gospel, he starts calling them out. It's religion. It's religion. You would see here, if you define it that way, you need to lose your religion and understand the gospel. That it's not Jesus plus what you can add to his work. It's Jesus plus nothing. It's incredible news. Verse 3. He says, For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised, meaning it's a matter of the heart matter of the heart. And then here's gospel straight up at you. Watch this. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us, and we put no confidence in human effort. That's the essence of it. It's relying on what Jesus has done for you rather than putting confidence in yourself that either you could save yourself or be good enough to earn God's favor or whatever. It's full and complete confidence in Christ and no confidence in yourself. So what then just bothers me is that when I talk to people these days about this very thing, namely what it takes to get to heaven, most people are saying something like this. Hey, if you're just a good person, if I'm good enough, if I do these things, oh yeah, you got to kind of believe these facts about Jesus, but if I do these things, then I'm, I'm going to heaven and they're talking more about what they can do for God than what God has done for them and therefore they're trusting in who? Themselves. They're relying on who? Themselves, because hopefully they'd be good enough and if they're not good enough in their mind, they're not going to make it where Paul says here, it isn't about putting confidence in what you can do for him. It's about relying on what he has done for you. You come to understand that, church. You start telling that to your friends, man, it will set people free left and right. Verse 4. Now, just for the sake of argument, listen to what he says. 
though I could have confidence in my own effort if anybody could. You want to talk about being a good person, Paul's saying? Hey, watch this. Indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. And he's fixing to give you a list of good things, basically, that he has done. He's saying, hey, you think you got a list of all these good things that are going to help you be made right with God? Guess what Paul's saying? My list is longer than yours. You can talk about being good. If that were what it was all about, it's just for the sake of argument, that was what it was about. You can talk about being good. He said, I got a list. I got a list. Let me tell you about my list. Here's his list. Verse 5. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. Watch this. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, like as for being a great person, I obeyed the law without fault. He's saying, what's your list? Why don't you trump that? And our equivalent would be a lot of people have a list they're trusting in, hopefully, to make them right with God. And that our list a lot of times goes something like this. Well, my parents were Christians. Uh, I was raised in a Christian home. I went to VBS as a kid, and I won Bible drill three times. Like, I, won, I memorized those verses. And I went to youth camp, and I've always tried to give money to the poor, and I'm a moral person. And a lot of people thinking about those things, coming up with a list, hoping and praying that list is going to help them one day. Like, hopefully, because I got this list of all these things I've done for God, this is ways I've been good, hopefully it's going to help me, and God's going to let me into heaven. Paul said, you got got a list? You can come up with a list. My list is even longer than yours. But then he says, here's what I think about the list. You ready for this? Seven. I once thought these things were what? Valuable. But now I consider them what? Worthless. Worthless. Once thought my list was valuable. Now I consider my list worthless because of what Christ has done. Not saying that the good things that he had done were bad in and of themselves. Like, oh, it's bad to do good things. Of course he's not saying that. He's just saying it's worthless to put your trust in those good things or your list to make you right with God. It's worthless. It doesn't work. And I got a list. I could try to put my trust in that list. It doesn't work, though. So the list is worthless. Putting my trust in the list, make me right with God, is worthless because it's not going to make me right with him. Watch this, verse 8. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as what? Garbage. More literally, it could be translated dung, crud, poop. All right, like this, that's what he thinks about it. Hey, the list, it's a piece of crud, basically. So that I could gain Christ and become one with him. (laughs) Here he goes again. In case you hadn't figured out the gospel yet by reading this passage, here he goes again. I no longer count on my own righteousness. I no longer count on the list through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through what? Through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on what? Faith. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. God's way of making us right with himself is the only way that matters. People can come up with a way, and that's what most people do today. Well, I'm going to heaven because I'm doing this. I'm going to get to heaven because I'm doing that. I'm going to heaven because I'm doing that. And everybody comes up with these reasons they're going to make it to heaven or ways they think they can get to heaven. It doesn't matter what they think. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what I think. What matters is what God says it takes to be made right with him. And Paul's saying right here in his word, God's way. You want to know God's way, which is the only way you can come to him, by the way. It's only God's way, not your way. It's God's way. God's way of making us right with himself, something everybody wants, depends on faith in Jesus. Jesus plus nothing. No contribution on my part. No no list on, on my part. My full confidence and total reliance upon Jesus. Him and nothing else. Him as my Savior Faith in him is what saves and makes you right with God. Not in what you can do for him. You don't need to add to what he's already done. He was perfect and then died a criminal's death on a cross to pay for the sins of those of us that would trust in him. There's a girl in our church. Her name's Ashley, and she finally, a couple weeks ago, she said she got it. Like she really understood what I just 
told you. And so she sent me an email. So I'm going to read you this email. But by the time I get to the end of the email, I need somebody to shout. All right, somebody better shout because this is incredible. Somebody better holla up in here because it's fixing to get incredible. Okay, so just wanted you to brace yourself. I know some of y'all don't know about hollering in church, but we do here. So here we go. Email. She said, I've been attending eLife off and on for at least a year now. Just wanted to let you know that I had my aha moment this morning. In the past few months, I realized I had never really committed my life to Christ and that I was just paying him lip service, as you would say. I had been going about it all wrong. I know that good works don't get you to heaven, but I felt like I wasn't worthy of being saved because I needed to make myself better by doing good things. That's what a lot of people think. This morning during the 1130 service, it hit me that no matter what I do, I will never be worthy of heaven no matter how many good things I do. Last sentence, and then let me hear somebody. So instead of trying to make myself worthy of the gift of salvation, she said, I just accepted it. That's what I'm saying. I mean, I was screaming when I read it. I was like, oh, my gosh, she got it. She, she got it. She's realizing, hey, Jesus plus nothing, I finally understand this, and it changed her life. She's got saved, put her trust in him, not herself, and thought, my gosh, my sins are forgiven. I'm right with him, and it's not about me. It was always about him. I just didn't realize it. And I just, I'm going, man. I told her, I wrote her back. I'm like, that just, that made my day. And we have a lot of people here that say similar things. Man, I finally got it. I finally got it. Because most people, I'd say people in here for sure, and definitely, you know, people that you work with and stuff like that, they don't get it. They don't get it. That's why they're always arguing, well, hopefully my list, I'm, my list, I hope my list is going to help me with God. And then she ended the email by saying, P.S., I used a Mac to type this email. <laughs> Which just topped it off, man. It thrilled my heart. So anyways, uh, I'll give you the opportunity here in a few minutes to make the same decision she did. It's not something you do. It's a decision you make to say, Jesus, I'm trusting in you and nothing else. I'm receiving that gift of salvation. You, some of you need to do it today. You know you're listening to this. You're like, dude, my trust has always been in my list. Don't let it be walking out of this place today fully and totally in Jesus. Rely on him. All right, let's keep going. Verse 10. I want to know Christ, Paul says, and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I've not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. Verse 15. Let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. And if you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. But we must hold on to the progress we have already made. Watch this. 17. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. I might write this down if you're taking notes. But if you want what Paul had, this is what he's saying. If you want what Paul had, namely lasting joy. If you want what Paul had, you need to do what Paul did. If you want what Paul had, you need to do what Paul did, which is what we've been talking about over the last couple of weekends. He's saying, pattern your life after mine. I'm patterning my life after Christ. I'm not perfect, though, Paul's saying, but I'm, I'm an example of what it looks like to pattern your life after Christ. So why don't you guys pattern your life after mine? If you want what I have, do what I do. And in the sense, verse 17 at the beginning, he says, dear brothers and sisters, like he's encouraging them, watch this, he's encouraging them to pattern their lives after his together. Together, like not on their own because they'd be less likely to do it. But like together, like he's writing to the church, saying to the church, hey, you guys together, like church together, Christians together, pattern your life after mine. And you know, that's kind of the, the sense behind the big ideas over the last couple of weekends, if you've been here. We've said things like, if you want to experience true joy, humble yourselves. Live as citizens of heaven. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. Did you know that in those texts, he's speaking in the plural. He's talking to them like, you guys live as citizens of heaven together. Like, do that together because you'd be more likely to do it together than by yourself. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. The sense was together. Together. Joy is found together. 
because we're more likely to do these things in the company of other people that want to do these things. Here's the big idea if you're taking notes. This is huge. And this isn't adding, really, like one more thing to what we've been talking about the last couple weekends. This is qualifying what we've been talking about. You ready? Very simple. You're most likely to experience true joy if you're pursuing true joy with other Christians. It's that simple. You're most likely to experience true joy if you're pursuing true joy with other Christians. What we're saying we want, what Tom Brady is looking for, most likely to find it in the company of other people that are pursuing it with you, holding you accountable in the pursuit. Because we're more likely to do it with other people, do something like this together than trying to do it on our own. Verse 18. Paul says, for I have often told you before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They're headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they think only about this life here on earth. So he's saying that example, don't pattern your life after that. Don't do that. But, verse 20, but we are citizens of heaven. Remember that from week two, Philippians 1? We're citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly uh, waiting for him to return as our Savior. Verse 21, he will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. So Paul's saying, together, church, together, Christians, pattern your lives after my. Here's his pattern. If you're taking notes, three things, three aspects of his pattern. These are huge that we've just read. Number one, Paul's pattern. He wanted to experience Christ. Paul's saying, verse 10, he wanted to experience him. He actually said, I want to know him. Like, know him personally. The sense of the word is not just know more about him. Paul knew quite a bit about him. He wanted to know him personally and experience him deeply. He wanted to, he wanted to, to experience him, not just know more about him. And I don't know if some of you guys knew this, but one of the reasons we named the church Experience Life is because my experience had been many people that I talked to, their experience had been that they knew a lot about God. Maybe they went to church some, they knew a lot about him, but they didn't really know him. Like they hadn't really experienced a lot of what they knew. And I just heard people saying, hey, I know a lot about him, I, but I, wanted, I want to experience what I know. I don't want to just hear the word like we talked about last week. I want to do the word. I want to live this thing out. I want to know him and experience what I've already learned. Because here's what I found in my life. I knew a lot about God. But when I started experiencing him, that's what changed my life, turned my world upside down, and set my heart on fire for him. Because for once in my life, I was finally experiencing him. Did you know that the God of heaven and earth, you can know him? Not just know about him. You can know and experience him personally. If you haven't, dude, you're missing out. Missing out. His pattern. He wanted to experience Christ. Number two, he wanted to be like Christ. Paul did. He wanted to be like Christ. Verse 12, he said, I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. He makes it clear in this passage, I'm not perfect, but I'm striving to be. And not in a legalistic sense, but like if you're striving, church, check this out. If you're striving to become more like Jesus, Jesus was what? Perfect. So essentially, that's what you're striving for. Not that we arrive in this life. But we're striving for that. We want to be more like him, and he was without sin. You see, our motto here at Experience Life is just, I love it, no perfect people allowed. People talk about it all the time. They wear the T-shirt. I love the T-shirt. No, hey, come to our church. No perfect people allowed. No perfect people allowed. And what we mean by that, like Paul's saying here, none of us are perfect, and so we shouldn't act perfect or put on a mask when we come to church and act like we got it all together when we're really not, when we're really struggling. Nobody's Nobody, we're not perfect, so don't act like you're perfect when you're not. But some people, I think, misunderstand the motto. And here's what they think. That's what we mean, but here's what they think. Nobody's perfect, so there's no need to strive to be. Like, if I just want to keep living like I'm living, just in sin and in rebellion against God, that's cool with him, because no perfect people allowed. Wrong, that's not cool. That's not cool. When we start to experience God, he starts to change us. So even though we're saying no perfect people allowed, meaning we're not perfect, we're not going to act like we're perfect and have it all together when we don't, guess what, church? We should be striving to be. 
I mean, nobody would say walking out of here today, okay, here's the thing, pastor. I want to sin at least another 100 million times in my life. Please, God, let me rebel against you and act like a weirdo another 100 million times. No, all of us would say, I hope I never sin again. Now, we all struggle. I mean, I get that. But the point is, if we're becoming more like Jesus, he's changing us. So it's not the attitude of no perfect people allow us. We'll just keep doing what we're doing and just feel good about it. No, we shouldn't feel good about it. We should not want to be deceived by the enemy, and we should want to walk closely with Jesus. So Paul's here saying, and hopefully we desire to be like him. Paul wanted to be like Christ. Number three, this is big. He wanted to forget his past. He wanted to forget his past. In verse 13, he said, forgetting the past and looking forward. Many of you know, and he said it in this text, Paul had a rough past. Some of you here today, had a rough past. I know I've even had a rough past. Paul had, a lot of us, probably all of us would say we've had a rough past. Paul had a rough past. It, in fact, it says in this passage, he, he harshly persecuted the church. Harshly persecuted the church. So he knew he would not be effective in his walk with Jesus if he could not forget his past and move on. And I think a lot of times, you know what's bogging us down? Maybe what's bogging you down, what's bogged me down points in time in my life is our past and it keeps us from moving forward. And we think to ourselves, well, you know, I've di- I did this, so God surely can't love me. I mean, I know he probably does, but I don't know if he can because I have d- did this. I've been there. I've been. Jesus came to set us free from our sins, past, present, and future, to forgive our past, set us free. It's like he's unlocked the chains, and we're still holding on to them. And church, guess what? we got to let go of the chains. The chains of your past that are keeping you from moving forward. you got to let go. Make amends where you need to. Ask for forgiveness where you need to. But then like Paul, you got to forget about it, man. Because I know some of you, it's paralyzing you. Thinking about, oh man, God couldn't use me. Yes, he can. Forget it. Look forward to what's ahead, Paul says. So essentially here he's saying, hey, this is my pattern. Pattern your life after mine. But the sense is, you guys do it together or you're probably not going to do it. Pattern your life after mine with other Christians, you're probably not going to do it. Which is why at Experience Life, when we first started, we created Life Houses. How many of you guys heard of Life Houses? Heard us talk about it a couple times? Okay, some of you haven't. Basically, Life Houses, they're smaller groups, meet some in homes, restaurants, whatever. Small groups, people that get together that desire what I'm talking about, the desire to experience true joy, desire to grow spiritually, and they get together and pursue those things together, which makes them a lot more likely to experience them, namely spiritual growth and true joy. These, these groups do. I can tell you hundreds of stories. There's over a 1,000 people, I think, in our life houses right now. Hundreds of stories, people saying, once I finally got together with some other people that could keep me accountable and pray for me, man, I started moving forward more quickly in my walk with Jesus. So important. And some of you say, life houses, that sounds kind of cool, but I mean, that sounds also kind of weird. I'm not even sure what you do with that. Like, what is a, what are you doing in a life house? It's simple. It's a lot more enjoyable than you might expect that it would be, all right? People hang out together, get to know each other. They talk about the weekend message. They'll answer questions about this. Nobody has to answer, but they'll just talk about, hey, how do we live this out? And then break into smaller groups for accountability. It's awesome. Everybody that gets in one from what I've heard, they, they enjoy it for sure. I think that they grow spiritually because of it. So Clayton, our Lifehouse pastor and operations pastor, uh, not only does he oversee the groups, he also leads a group. And we have him on video sharing a little bit about how his group has impacted his life. So take a look at this. My life was really changed and set on fire was through being a part of a small group that met together for community and for studying the Bible together and praying together and keeping one another accountable for those things and for how I was doing that week. Being a part of a life house and life transformation group has been, uh, you know, life changing for my wife and I, uh, for Darby and I, as we've led our life house, as we've participated in our life house. It's helped us to continue to grow in our relationship with Jesus, uh, to, to develop you know, deeper relationships with other believers that are based on Jesus. And that community spurs you on and encourages you to continue to grow in your uh, relationship with Jesus. Being a part of a Lifehouse and Life Transformation Group is a place where you can devote yourself to those things um, with other people, which makes it a whole lot easier. By 
hearing these things and talking about these things in the context of community in that small group, it really helps you to begin to live out and obey uh, the things that we're talking about, you know, like I never have before in my life. You know, since I've been at Experience Life and have been in LifeHouse and Life, Tra Life Transformation Group and have been a LifeHouse leader, uh, you know, I can say that my marriage has gotten better. I, I've lived out being the spiritual leader of my home more so than I ever did before. And I know that LifeHouse and Life Transformation Group has been, have been a major part of that. So, you know, I would definitely challenge anyone who's not involved in a, in a LifeHouse, Life Transformation Group to, to get involved, to plug into one of those groups. That accountability um, is what will help you to grow in your relationship with Jesus and actually be obedient to those things that we always talk about, but that it seems so hard, you know, to actually do in daily life. And again, there could be hundreds of others that would share a similar story about how it's helped their marriage or just helped them to grow spiritually. But let me dispel some myths real quick, okay? Because a lot of people come up with reasons they shouldn't go, and a lot of them end up being lame because when they hear a response to the reason, they're like, oh, I didn't, I didn't realize that. Some people are like, well, it'd be awkward. If I went to somebody's house, I didn't even know them, that'd be awkward. You don't go to somebody's house you don't know. You're actually going to know, get to know the leader before you even go. So you're already going to know somebody in the group when you go. Some people say, well, here's the thing. I don't want somebody asking me weird questions like about my past. I'm going to have to confess it to the whole group. I'm going to start crying. I mean, I don't want to do that. That would be really weird. They don't do that in that group, okay? Some people say, well, I don't know a lot about the Bible. Like Adam and Eve, I'm like, I'm not even sure. And so, uh, you know, people think that Noah got swallowed by a whale, you know, or, uh, you know, Jonah built an ark. And so, uh, I mean, there's lots of people say, I'm just, I'm not, I don't know a lot yet. Is that, I mean, do you have to know a lot? Dude, a lot of people that go, they're saying, hey, the reason I'm going is I want to learn more. I don't know a lot. Some people say, well, hey, I bet there's not a group that's right for me. Bro, let me just tell you, or sis, uh, we got like, <laughs> we got like over 60 groups now that meet. And we got like men's groups, women's groups, married, single, young, old, and older. And, uh, and... <laughs> We got you covered. You know, we got uh, recovery groups, uh, ex-offenders, like gotten out of prison groups. We got um, ones that have child care for kids. I, uh, you know, I, I keep going. There's just tons of groups. There's over 60 of them. There's a group I think that's, that's right for you. And so uh, here's really the challenge today. Remember to experience life, culture of immediate response. We don't want to just hear the word and walk out. Oh, that was great. You know, I'm going to go to lunch. Let, let's do something about it. Here's my challenge. Pull this out real quick. Card you got in your chair. Real quick, and then we're done. This is just a LifeHouse interest card. Here's my, my challenge to you right now. Some of you take me up on it. I'm going to challenge it to you right now. Would you at least, I'm not asking you to sign up for a LifeHouse, like for sure go, because you're like, I'm not even totally sure yet. Would you at least fill out some information if you don't go to a LifeHouse on this card and let a leader call you? That's all I'm asking. That's not hard. Like you can walk out of here having responded to the message by doing something that is not difficult. You can put your name on here, check your life stage. We've got buckets on either side of the stage, both sides of the stage and in the back that you can drop these in, tear it off or whatever. But what keeps you, I mean, for the sake of your spiritual growth, right? For the sake of your joy from considering getting together with other people like yourself that are desiring to pursue those things. Man, you're more likely to experience it. That's why I'm encouraging you as a response to the message to do it. So all this says is I'll, I'll let a leader call me. I'll have a leader call me and tell me about their group. I may not go. Like if you talk to some freak in nature or something, you're like, that dude is a freak, you know, or something. You don't have to go. I wouldn't go either, all right? But I don't think we have any of those as LifeHouse leaders. So all this is is saying, you can call me, you can call me, and somebody can at least tell me about the group, and then I'll decide if I want to go. Would you at least give us that chance, practical way to respond? So I'm going to pray. Then you're going to have the opportunity to fill this out as the band plays, and there's buckets here in the front and in the back. I challenge you to respond today. Remember this. Big idea today is you're most likely to experience true joy if you're pursuing true joy with other Christians. Why not, why not today decide that's what you're going to do? I'm going to at least be open to consider pursuing these things that I'm desiring with other people that want to pursue them as well. What keeps you from making that decision? Let's pray today. God, thank you for Philippians 3. It's so powerful, so rich, so full of just wisdom. And God, I just pray that we would heed its instruction. God, I thank you for all those here today that uh, are hearing this good news of the gospel. And they're saying, I want to respond like Ashley did. Jesus plus nothing for me. I'm not trusting in my list anymore. I would just challenge you right where you're at to just pray and say, Jesus, I commit my life to you. And now I'm relying totally on you 
to save me. Not on myself, what I can do for you. Jesus, my faith is completely in you and what you've done for me. You make that decision today, you'll walk out of here a new, different person. Most important decision you can make. And God, for my friends here today that aren't going to a life house, that aren't in community, that aren't pursuing these things with other Christians, God, I pray that you convict their heart and challenge them to at least take a call from a leader about how maybe they could get involved. God, thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. If you made a decision to commit your life to Christ, I'd love to know about it. You can email me at chris at experiencelifenow.com. Also, if you're interested in taking a next step, check out our website at experiencelifenow.com and click on Next Steps. Let us know if we can ever serve you in any way, and we look forward to seeing you soon.